and ran from grace, despised and rejected all your ways. How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us. That he would send his only son to come and rescue us. He has given us, called us, played with, guides us now and will sustain us. Oh, how wonderful the Father's love. No mercy floods our lives with kindness. Your grace is colored all we see, and you have promised not to Thank you. Grateful hearts, we sing. 
morning. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. Beginning at verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And all of God's people said, Amen. Please join me in praying. Father God, we're so grateful and thankful that we can be in your house this morning, giving you praise, honor, and glory, hearing your word from our elder Vitaly. We pray that you'll be powerfully upon him with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Give us the messages that we each need to hear um, from you. Jesus, we deeply desire to follow you. Um, guide us, direct us through Vitaly's um, preaching of your word. Teach us and tell us how to follow you, Lord. Um, give us the desire to be consistent in following you. We praise you. We give you honor and glory that you've chosen us, Lord. Um, some of us were rejected in this life in various ways. We've been discarded and ostracized. And we just pray that, praise you that in 1 Corinthians you tell us that you've chosen the foolish of this world to confound the wise, to bring glory to your holy name. May we follow you in a way that brings glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. So encouraged to be here, be able to open God's word with you today. Just wanted to tell you that I was very comfortable with my life up until earlier this month when I received an email from Pastor Todd. He said, hey, V, what do you think about preaching this Sunday? And that just blew me out of my comfort zone. But I'm very excited for the message today to talk about discipleship, talk about following Christ. When we call people to faith and hope in Jesus Christ, when we encourage them to walk by faith, we encourage them to follow Jesus. We encourage them to take a step of faith. It's like a gentle push. It's not a kick, Pastor Todd. <laughs> but I'm grateful for you that God is using you to stretch me and stretch other men. Uh, today we're in Mark 1, as Rob read this morning. Jesus is passing along the sea, and he sees two disciples, uh, Andrew and Peter, casting nets into the water. It was something they had to learn. There's a, there's a special way you put the nets in the water you have to know the direction of the flow, making sure nothing tangles up, something they had to learn to do. And it's, it was their job. It's the way to bring food to the table. It was their income. And Jesus comes to them and says, come and follow me. And notice what stands out to me is that he's not calling, as his first disciples, he's not calling somebody that's influential, somebody that has a high education, or have power, maybe not the smartest people of the world, but just like Jesus called his first disciples, he also calls us today. On the screen, disciple-making is the organic and intentional pursuit of helping others love God, love others, and make disciples. It is organic, it is natural, you really don't have to put a special discipleship head on to make disciples. But it's also intentional. It has a purpose in mind. And for me, intentional usually it means it requires efforts. It's getting out of the comfort zone and be who God called you to be. And he called you to be his disciples. Again, disciple-making is organic and intentional, and we need to learn to be intentional where God planted us. Robbie Gallaty writes in his book, Five Marks, he says, Do not be so quick to cross the ocean to share the gospel with the nations. 
that you neglect crossing the street to share the gospel with your neighbors. Crossing the ocean is good. If you have that opportunity, if you can go, awesome. Please consider that. But don't neglect to cross the street to talk to your neighbor. Don't neglect to cross maybe the hallway to talk to your family member. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, uh, I was in a C group leadership training with Pastor Brad. And we had our, you know, worksheets in front of us. And one of the questions that Brad asked us, he said, write down three to five people that you will invest and pray for that will help you multiply the group, multiply the C group. And I thought that was a little awkward question for me personally because I wasn't even a C group leader at that time. But that made me think ahead that I'm not here forever. My job is to invest into someone else so they can keep on doing it. But when he asked the question, one person that just popped up in my head right away, the first name that I thought of was a young man that I knew, a person who doesn't even know Christ. He's not even a Christian. And I was thinking about it, and I still wrote his name down, and I'm thinking as I'm writing it down, man, this is so foolish. He's not even a Christian himself. He's not even following Christ. But do you know what that did to me? It made me pray for that person continuously. And since that time, God has provided a lot of opportunities to share God's truth with this young man. Now, he's a very smart guy. He reads a lot. He listens to podcasts a lot. He's pretty much smarter than me. And the opportunities that I had to share the gospel and share God's truth with him, I'll be honest with you, not all of them were good. Some of them were pretty awkward. I felt unprepared. He knew how to ask some really tough questions. And also the answers that I gave him, most of them he just rejected. He pretty much disagreed with it. And that made me very discouraged. I thought, why am I even wasting my time with this guy? You know, I should be doing something more useful. A couple of weeks ago, I got to see this young man again, and we just talked about life, tried to catch up on things. And then he says, hey, got a question for you. So why did Jesus need to die? Um, couldn't God just forgive a sinner? Is it required to have a sacrifice? But you know what? I believe providentially God gave me an opportunity a couple of days before that to talk to another brother about the justice and righteousness of God, that God has to be just. He needs that payment for the sin in order to stay just. And I was pretty much prepared at that moment to answer to him. But I also learned something. God was working in his life. Yes, there were some, a lot of disagreements. Yes, I got discouraged. But it's not I who save people. My success is by sharing God's truth, being faithful to proclaim God's word to people. And it's the Spirit of God that works in them. So I hope you get encouraged and remember that your words are not in vain when you preach God's word. Now, when Jesus calls us, number one, he says, come and be with me. Mark 3.13 on the screen says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. Notice that he wanted those 12 disciples to be with him, physically present in the same area. Why? Why was he so intentional? Well, because he wanted to send them out to preach. He had a purpose in mind. Pastor Rob mentioned this morning that back in the day, students went to seek, seek out teachers looking for teachers, and then they would promise faithfulness to the Old Testament law. 
Jesus does something the opposite. He's not waiting for the disciples to come and look for him. He does the opposite. He says, come and follow me. He calls his disciples to him. One verse that I really like, John 15, 16, something I had to wrestle with for a long time. But it's so comforting. Let me read that. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask, in, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Can you imagine when God was creating this world, he had your name before his eyes. He was thinking of you the one whom will, he will call to be his follower, the one whom he will call to be his disciple. And remember that God placed you in the area, in the place, workplace, classroom, neighborhood, so you would be intentional there, so you would be physically present with the people surrounding you. Second, when God... When Jesus calls us, he calls us to come and see. John 1, 38 writes, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. Now, to give a little background on this verse, Andrew the one whom Jesus called. Uh, initially, he was the disciple of John the Baptist. And he heard John speaking of Jesus. John said, this is the Lamb of God. So after he heard that him and another disciple, I think it was John, they started to follow Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, can I help you? He says, we want to see. We want to see where you, where you live, who you are. He says, Come and you will see. He invites them over. He wants them to be present with him. And through the Gospels, as you read the story, you'll see that Jesus is continuously having his disciples nearby, next to him. They were looking at him. They were learning. They, they've seen how Jesus prayed. They have seen how he spoke to families, how he spoke to little kids, little children. They have seen Jesus uh, how he preached to the crowds, how he addressed the, addressed the enemies. They have seen him, how he treated women. They've seen him cry. They've seen him being happy. They've seen him sad, grieving. And it wasn't just one type of event when Jesus brought him over into his life. It was a lot of different experiences where they learned how to live out the gospel in many different circumstances. But they had an opportunity to be with him, to watch him, to listen to him, and my favorite one, to ask him questions. They got to ask Jesus questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions for Christ. I, I, I want to, sometimes I have to make a decision. I really want to know what would be the best thing to do. Jesus was nearby. He, he was teaching his disciples but hear this, Jesus wants us to walk with him today and learn from him, to be like him. How do we do that? Well, the Bible says that we have the Spirit of Christ in us. And we're also privileged to have the Spirit, his words, uh, words of Christ here in front of us. And it's a privilege. So we can use this to learn to be Christ-like. We can use this to learn from him. We were doing some remodeling at our house, and I needed to replace a closet door. So I brought a new door home and needed to paint it. And I thought it would be a good opportunity for my five-year-old son at that time to help me with painting that door. Give him a roller. He's putting the paint on, right? And he tells me, Dad... Our house looks pretty on the inside. We did some remodeling. But it looks so old on the outside. 
And I'm thinking, what a great teaching opportunity, right? I tell him, son, do you know, a lot of people are just like that. They may appear one way on the outside, but they're so different on the inside. And I was so grateful for this opportunity, already praising God for this divine appointment. And he tells me, yeah, Dad, we have skin on the outside and bones on the inside. <laughs> like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> but I wonder, I wonder if that's how Jesus felt. He tells them, man, I'm about to be delivered. I'm about to be killed. But on the third day, I will rise again. And it says, and they understood none of the things he was saying. But you know what's the good news? When time came, when Jesus did resurrect, it says they remembered. They remembered what he was saying to them. Then Jesus appeared to them. He was opening their eyes. He was revealing his truth to them. So I want to encourage you today that the words you speak, they don't go in vain. People will remember of them, and the Holy Spirit will work in people. Third, when Jesus calls, <clears throat> he calls us to come and follow him. Verse 17, as we read, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you the fishers of man. It was a call to action. It was a call to be disciple, to be a learner of Christ, of a teacher. 1 John 2, 6, he writes, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We need to learn to walk in the same way in which he walked. He's calling them to adopt the way of life that Jesus is teaching. We're called to reflect Christ. We call, we're called to live out the life Jesus lived. Now, just want to remind you, it will not be perfect. Our walk with the Lord will not be perfect, but we mature, we grow in Christ. I think I was six years old when my parents went on vacation to western part of Ukraine. It's a mountain, woodsy mountain area, clean air. I grew up on the eastern side. We had a lot of coal mines, very polluted, dirty air, so we went to the other side of the country. We stayed in the country, uh, in the town that was like right between the mountains. The houses were so spread apart, and uh, there, were, there were barely roads, like you had to walk through the woods a lot. One time we were coming back to the house we were staying with, with my parents, and it was dark outside. I remember holding my mom's hand, I'm scared, I don't, I don't see where we're going, we're just I'm just following them. I'm putting all my trust in them, right? And then my dad stops. He says, I don't remember this river here. I, I don't know this place. I've never been here before. And mom's like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, this is awkward. <laughs> I put all my trust in my, in my parents to follow them, but my you know, leaders got lost. And they just yelled out the name of a lady, the owner of the house. And thank God she heard us. She yelled back, stay where you're at. I'm going to come and get you. She comes. She has no flashlight. She knows the place. She has been there. She's like, oh, you're only, I don't know, half a kilometer away. What's, I'll take you back home. You're fine. Feet are wet and everything. I was so grateful that that night was over. We got home. But you know what? We are called to walk in the same way he walked. Because if we don't, we'll get lost. It's not an option. You will get lost if you're not walking his way. To follow Jesus is a lot like repentance. I copied, copied this definition from a sermon sheet from last week. Repentance is a change of mind and heart that leads to a change of direction. Think about this. When Jesus calls you, he calls you to take a new direction. He calls you to live a new life, a transformed life, empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
Again, it's not going to be a perfect life, but it is empowered by His Spirit. He's calling us to serve a new master, a good master, master that calls himself our friend. He's calling us to be part of a new kingdom because he took us out of the darkness. Remember that Jesus was sent by his Father, a perfect son who took our sins on the cross. He died on the third day. He rose again, declaring that those who will put their trust in him and his work on the cross, those who will make him their Lord of their lives, he will declare them righteous, forgiven, accepted. He declared that those will be saved from the punishment we all deserve. question for you is, are you willing to become his follower today? What's holding you back? Now, if you have been walking with the Lord, what's holding you back from being intentional to help others love God and love others and make disciples? Jesus calls us, and he also commissions us. Just like in the verse 17, Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become the fishers of man. Number one, Jesus commissions us to love God and love people. If you can turn with me to Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, the one who created the world, came into this world to serve because he loved us so much. It is the supernatural love that he gives us now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be able to love others. It's that love that drives us to care for others. It's that love that drives us to serve others, sacrifice our interest for the sake of other, for the sake of others. That love motivates us to reach out to our neighbors, to our friends with the gospel, with the good news. Question is, do you love enough that you're willing to reach out, that you're willing to make a fool out of yourself? to speak the truth of Christ to the people that, where he placed you. One of my coworkers needed a surgery, and I wanted to let him know that I'll be praying for him. Um, we had a little bit of disagreement prior to that about the fact of existence of God. And we kind of talked about it, and it didn't end that. It wasn't a pleasant conversation. Let's put it that way. So I'm wondering if I should even bother to, of texting him. And I was wrestling with myself, and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to ask him. And I asked, is it okay if I'll be praying for you? He said, sure. A couple of days later, when he came back to work, he stops by and he says, listen, you really should not ask that. You know, just the fact that you're willing to take your time to pray to your God means so much to me. And I was thinking, wow, even though he doesn't believe in God, he, he wants me to pray for him. You know, people don't care what we know until they know that we care. We are commissioned to love God and love others. Second, Jesus commissions his disciples to deeply listen to others. While you're in Mark, please go to page 847 if you're using a church Bible. Mark 10, 51. And Jesus said to, them, to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. 
Now, I believe that Jesus was the greatest and best teacher in the world. He had the truth to preach. He had the word of God to proclaim to, to the world. But he wasn't preaching all the time. He was also listening. He asked this blind man, he said, what do you want? He was asking questions, uh, and he was listening to them. If you ever get people to talk to you um, about what they believe, you'll notice that once they formulate their thoughts into words, and they will start speaking them out loud, they will start speak of their deepest beliefs, what they truly believe. And a lot of times they'll surprise themselves of what they believe. So we don't have to listen of the next thing we have to say while this person is speaking. We're commissioned to just listen. Listen to what their heart believes and look for the uh, root issue there. Third, Jesus commissions us to engage others with questions. Mark 8, uh, 29, if you can turn with me. Mark 8, 29, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Now, the word got around. People are talking about Jesus. Some say he's the prophet. Other people say he's the beheaded John the Baptist that came back to life. And the disciples come to Jesus and say, did you hear what they're saying? Did you hear? Did you hear what they believe? And Jesus knew that. He knew that the crowd was confused. But notice, he's not addressing the crowd. He's addressing his disciples. He says, but who do you say that I am? In Matthew 17, 25, there's another story where tax collectors come to get the tax from the disciples, and they first talk to Peter, and uh, Jesus comes, Matthew 17, 25, I'll read, Jesus spoke to him, to Peter first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth they take toll and tax? From the sons or from the others? I can't, I can't imagine this picture. You have government officials standing here about to press charges for you not paying the taxes, and Jesus says, Hey, Simon, let's have this teaching opportunity. Sit down. Let me ask you this question. What do you think? You know? But Jesus is commissioning us to engage others with questions. Something that I personally learning right now is that statements accuse. People put up defenses automatically. But questions convict. Questions make people think Make, makes them think of what they truly believe, makes them come up with an answer. Something stirs up in the people when we ask them questions. You are commissioned to engage others with questions. Four, Jesus commissioned us to wisely redirect. You know when you speak the truth and it hits home, people will try to avoid the truth as much as they can. They will go into different rabbit trails, but we need to learn not to go in that hole with them. Stay on point. Don't wrangle over foolish words. Remember why you're being intentional. Remember the purpose you're even having this conversation. I'm not going to read this uh, passage for this time's sake, but maybe you'll be able to read that in your community groups. You know, when the two parties questioning Jesus, should we pay the tax to Caesar or not? Learn to wisely redirect others. And five, speak the truth. You're commissioned to speak the truth. Mark 14, 61. Can you read that with me?
but he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked them, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. <laughs> when I was reading this, I was thinking, when was, the, when was the last time I shared this with others? That this, this Christ, you will see him seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. You know, the central activity of disciple-making is preaching his word, is sharing God's truth with others. Remember in John 17, when Jesus prayed, he said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. Remember that it is the word of God that sanctifies us. It is his word that transforms our minds. It's not my convicting words that can persuade people to believe differently. It is the word of Christ that works actively. So please don't underestimate the impact of God's word. Rabbi Gallaty wrote in one of his books, he said, when you study and grow, remember that you're not merely learning for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of others. Any of you like to cook or bake? You know how you play with the recipes? different ingredients, trying to get for that perfect flavor, and you get something nailed down. So you get a full spoon of it, and you come to your spouse, become this most annoying person in the world, saying, you really have to try this. This is so good. I got it. You really have to try it. I do it to my wife sometimes with my hot sauce, and she hates hot sauce. <laughs> Are you sharing what God is revealing to you when God speaks to you, are you, first question, are you writing it down so you remember it? Here journals are great. It's, a, it's an awesome tool that I love to use. Are you writing what God is revealing to you? Second question, are you sharing it with other people? Because I know you get excited for it. Why don't you share it with others? Go talk to your wife, your husband, your kids, and tell them, hey, you really got to try this. This is so good. This is what God is speaking to me right now. We really need to learn to depend on the Word of God. We need to learn to depend on His Spirit. Just want to remind you of the definition we spoke earlier. Disciple-making is the organic and intentional pursuit of helping others love God love others, and make disciples. I just want to remind you that you are sent people to love God, love others, and to make disciples. Let's pray as the group goes on stage. Father, thank you. Thank you for calling us to be your followers. Lord, I pray you empower us to live the way you lived, to walk the way you walked. Lord, teach us to live out the gospel the way you did it. And Lord, I pray you stir up our hearts, our desire to love you, love others, and go and make disciples. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for your good.